So welcome back and let's start as usual by talking about what you remember from the last lecture. If anything. The discussion about black box versus not black box, right? When should you use maybe not a black box model? Anything else? Sort of explanations and user impact or user interactions. Mm -hmm. It was fairly superficial, but yeah, consider how to present whether and how to present explanations to users, right? Depends on how critical the task is, how confident we are, right? Look at a few examples of those. Anything else? Let's take one more. We talked about a few more techniques, um, such as counterfactuals, um, prototypes, criticisms, um, those kind of things, and influential instances that can be used in all kinds of ways. Um, yeah, and want to, whether or not to trust the output. All right, today we're kind of staying in the overall theme of maybe debugging, uh, understanding a system, and I want to talk about provenance and to some degree reproducibility. So let's take again an example. We talked about this before, um, kind of a very public media backlash after a well-connected person on Twitter wrote about how he believes that the Apple card is such discriminatory uh, algorithm because they provided different um, credit ratings to him and his wife. And then also, a thread kind of following up on this of how he spoke to representatives and tried to debug this, but the answer was essentially, yeah, it's just the algorithm. Um, we can't do anything really, right? So again, there's a question here about understanding what happens, whether there's actually bias in the system. Um, last week we talked about explanations. So if you look at a specific model and a specific outcome, can we understand why the model made the prediction? Maybe what data influenced the model um, to be done this way? But there are a couple of more challenges in debugging this. What you frequently have is kind of non-trivial pipelines. This is just something that I made up on the spot before the class, but uh, you can think about, if we want to think about a credit card offer there are a lot of information that goes into this in some form. There's some credit scoring model um, where you, you have some information about the customer to get their credit score, maybe the kind of purchase history or what kind of things they buy uh, might go into the specific model, I don't know. Um, um, it uses historic data, but then this is not the only model, right? So there's a model that maybe analyzes the, the patterns that's used as input to this model. And then the credit score is one of multiple information that's actually determined to figure out what the credit limit is, how much money are you giving them, maybe to how much, to what condition. This involves probably some um, value function that somebody has evaluated based on cost and risk and how much we are evaluating, maybe on market condition, like the bank can get how much um, money for what rate and is giving this to somebody else, right? And in the end, what we're criticizing is that this offer here in the end, for two, two different people that we put in, the offer is different and we want to know why. Right? so we want to debug, potentially understand what's happening. We can understand maybe, hopefully, probably not, but with some techniques, the three uh, machine learning models that are involved, potentially, right? But in actually understanding what happens there, couple of more things that we need to do to reproduce this case in the first place. So today's lecture is really about um, understanding how do we get to this choice? What version of this model was used to use it? What inputs did this model get, which sometimes come from other models? What data was used to train this model? What specifically has a customer put in 
that, that they are unhappy about? How has this triggered and flown through the model? Right? So those are common debugging problems. You make a prediction and you want to know why am I making this prediction? You can look at a specific model. Hopefully you know which model was used. All these models are potentially updated, maybe once a day, maybe once a week. Some of this data changes, right? So if I want to know where did yesterday's prediction come from, I need to know yesterday's market condition, which are not directly the customer input, but other input that flows into this thing. Right? So there's, there's all this kind of information that we want to potentially need, right? So, can we reproduce the problem? This is kind of where we, where we want to go at. And that's actually highly trivial if all the things change all the uh, highly non-trivial if all the things change all the time. So what inputs were used for the model or multiple models? Which exact model version was used? If we do some form of A-B testing at the same time, we need to know that in, in addition, right? What data was the model trained with? So we might figure out that the model is biased can we figure out why the model is biased and how we go back to this? Um, what code was actually learned, uh, used to train the model? What feature extraction code, what algorithm, what library? Um, where does the data come from? How was it processed? What features were extracted from the data? Um, if there are multiple ver versions, right? Which version produced which input to the model? Um, and then if we get the wrong answer here or an answer that we kind of don't expect, which part of all of this training data or user data or certain models, a certain intermediate result, what's actually causing the problem? Right, so I'm going not to talk anymore about understanding an individual model, but what we want to focus on today is kind of understanding how do all the parts came into place and how was a specific pr uh, prediction made? And typically this is called provenance. Provenance is a term for tracking the origin and the changes over the history of data. Where is data coming from? Who has changed it? How has it been changed? Um, typically you want to be able to track um, every step and, and know who's responsible for changes. Um, right? So track the origin, data provenance is this with regard to data, track the origin of our data, where was it collected, collected by whom, modified by whom, modified when, modified why. Um, if there were algorithms that kind of produce the data, right? it's kind of some intermediate uh, processing steps or so extracted something. How was this produced? Was this produced with another model? Right, so if we go back to this credit card example here, we may have an output of this model or even just the credit score, right? We might need to know what version of the credit card scoring mechanism has produced the input for our model. Um, so what other model or what other algorithm has produced certain data? Um, Right, so this is kind of non-trivial, right? And then you kind of want to track how data flows through the system, um, model dependencies and flows is sometimes called visibility debt. In the paper that you uh, talked, uh, that you read in the very beginning of the semester. Um, in the reading, you looked at one specific approach um, that Google did to um, track provenance of some of their data. Do you remember how that worked? Can somebody just briefly describe the idea? Sorry, which example were you talking about? The goods paper, the, the paper you read for today. So this, this described how Google internally attempts to track some origins, right? So they have the problem that they have lots of data sets, models learned from different data sets. Um, and a lot of challenges, you're using some big table with some data that has been annotated maybe, but where is this coming from? Right, so they are doing some provenance tracking for their data internally. 
I signed that paper for today, right? Yeah, so basically, isn't it, um, they collect metadata on all their data sets, uh, and then, I guess, in automated fashion, then they expose an API internally where different teams can uh, access this uh, metadata. Mm -hmm. so, so metadata is one thing, so you can automatically generate some descriptions of this, but there's also interesting metadata about which process has produced a certain data set. Do you remember this part? To see whether a data set has been derived by cleaning another data set, for example. So, Did, Didn't they look for like common kind of column names or shapes or data to try to tie them together to see their um, like duplication or, or maybe uh, like you were saying, like one is derived from another? I don't remember the details myself anymore, to be honest, but um, I think there's some of this. Um, the main thing that I remember, um, that's why I think this is actually a pretty, pretty interesting thing. So Google runs a, all of their big jobs in some cloud services, right? So there's a certain amount of infrastructure that all produces log files. So they know if they run a big map reduced job that it's reading from database A and writing into database B, for example. Right? So what they did here was analyzing all their log files essentially to see, oh, this database was written by this job and this job has read from these three other databases. Right, so what you get is some sort of um, diagram, essentially, where you have you have a bunch of databases and kind of steps to produce uh, to kind of process data with often a map reduce job or some big kind of data job, right, into a different database. Then maybe you produce a couple of different ones. You don't use one anymore, or you delete it, but you kind of produce another one, right? So you kind of, and if, you, if you're looking at a specific data set, you still have the chance of which other, or which processes have, have been run to producers based on which other data sets, right? So you might see um, certain kinds of patterns, or oh, this data is coming from this source, from this source originally executed with these processes. So when I talked about, um, big scale data processing and streaming, I, I had a slide where I kind of described one approach that I used, how data was kind of read from one stream, written into other streams, and then written again and so on. This was a diagram that I created manually myself for documentation, because I needed to understand kind of, oh, the, in this stream I'm producing data that comes from this other thing, and it's this algorithm or this, this program that reads from the stream, processes it, and puts it in the other stream. And so that's, that's a pure documentation thing that I did manually. Um, they do with a little bit of analysis of log files. It assumes that you have the infrastructure where everything is kind of somewhat uniform that you can actually track those and extract these dependencies from log files, which I think if you're building a startup or something like this, you probably don't have that infrastructure to just use whatever you do and extract it after the fact. Right, so we're going to talk about a bunch of tools that produce these pipelines and kind of force you to kind of document this or kind of put it into a format where these pipelines are automatically versioned and, and analyzed. But if you work in an infrastructure or in an organization where they have very defined infrastructure and maybe even the right log files, I think this is a pretty nice idea to just automatically capture this. Right. Um, the alternative is always to manually describe this, right? For every data set, this is produced by this other feature. This becomes a bit tedious to version and to update. This documentation is often very quickly out, to date, out of date and then often not updated. Um, but I think this is, this is an interesting direction at least. Um, that's why I kind of thought this might be an interesting read. All right, so that was, data provenance, kind of tracking where databases um, or 
individual rows of data come from. Um, there's feature provenance. So if we are learning over certain features, somebody needs to extract data from the training data or, or extract features, right? And both from the training data and from the inference data or from the live data, right? So if we again go back to this thing, there's at least when training the scoring model, somebody needs to extract from some training data, the features that we're using, and then somebody needs to do this from the live customer data. And hopefully we use the same mechanism to extract this, right? Hopefully we're not cleaning outliers in a different way or kind of normalizing data in a different way in one approach than in the other. Um, but these feature extraction algorithms might change from time to time. We might also add additional features, right? So it's useful to actually track for making a specific prediction. Maybe the prediction last week, we used the following version of the feature extraction code, right? Or the data cleaning code. And finally, there's model provenance. That's the idea of how do you know which model was used and where is this model coming from? Like what, what uh, data was used to train this, what library was used, what hyperparameters were used, what's the code to produce this, right? Um, and if there are multiple models, what other models have provided input. So that's what we've talked about. And it's, again, it's very common, these are examples from previous lectures, um, that you have multiple models in some form um, to build a system. Right, so this was an example of an automatic meme generator, just a hello world example of chaining multiple models. Here's an architecture that I took from a paper or kind of a subset of an architecture for self-driving car where there are lots of models that are kind of involved, right? Object detection, object tracking, object motion prediction, just as kind of sequential ones and then a bunch of other things that all go into each, each other. So we kind of want to track um, at least data, features, and models. And we need to talk about how to do that, right? So we want to version data and models at least. You're all familiar with Git, but there's a bit of a question of how do we do this if we have fairly large training data, right? So let me start by asking you, um, how would you version training data? So let's assume just a practical setting um, following the movie scenario that you're using, right? So you're getting more and more ratings from users. Um, I suspect by this time your training data is a couple of hundred megabytes, probably 50, 100 megabytes, I don't know. My training data is about two gigabytes at this point um, and it's growing, right? It's growing with every day. Let's say you want to train a new model every day. So you want to version every day what data you used. How would you do that? I guess um, if you could capture, you'd want to, I would, I would suggest some kind of diff based thing because that would avoid having to replicate your entire data. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that way you could just capture the deltas because you can assume safely that you're not gonna drop any of your previous data. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, even then you could, I guess you could capture that as a delta too, but yeah, just basically uh, like what, what gets added from day to day right. as your so, file. Right, so, so one common approach to do the, uh, to version data any data really is to capture deltas, right? You start with an initial thing and then you essentially just describe changes. That actually also works well for um, removal of data or for kind of changing of individual fields, not just for adding things. Um, does anybody know which version control system works like this internally? Does anybody know how version control systems work internally? I would guess SVN. N, but I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I think as we end, I don't actually know, but I think they do something like this. I know that Git doesn't. Git doesn't store data. Mercurial does. So the internal model of Mercurial stores data. 
which means if you want to see the most recent version of a file, you potentially need to start with the earth first one and apply every single delta, right? So looking at a specific version might take a while. Um, but yeah, one, one way you could do this is have a file and then every day have a delta, essentially a diff for that file. And then you can say, um, if I want to restore the data from last week, I need to apply all the deltas up to last week, right? So you kind of have a list of deltas and you know what's the latest delta that you need to apply. What are other versions, uh, other strategies to version large data files? Anything else you have in mind? For time series based ones, assuming that it's append only, um, you can just record like the dates that you queried between. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you have something like Kafka, you just take the offset, although Kafka removes data at some point, but in, in append only data, you can essentially say how many lines have you imported. If you have time series data that you're not overwriting or something that you can query that's not changing over time, you can just specify the query. A simple version would just be to create copies, um, but that is kind of inefficient for large files, right? So this is how Git works internally. Git always stores copies of each file. Uh, it doesn't actually do any kind of compression. Um, and Git is not the best format to store large files for that reason. Like if you make a small change to a big file, you store an entire copy of that big file. Um, uh, GitHub currently has a limit of I think 50 or 100 megabytes. If you try to commit something bigger, you can commit it, but you can't push it to GitHub. Um, has somebody worked with a Git file system? There's an extension uh, that GitHub supports um, also for bigger files. Yeah, I read about, I read briefly about Git large file system and I know that uh, it's supposed to work as um, a, another storage uh, space that serves uh, larger files, but it still uh, enforces that two gigabyte um, uh, uh, maximum. Um, but I don't believe there's any versioning, um, con version control, data version control uh, uh, part of that. Okay. I would expect it to have it, but I haven't actually looked into this uh, more. Likewise. Um, yeah. I, think, um, I think with Git LFS, it does really basic versioning by just taking the hash mm -hmm. uh, of the entire, it. yeah. Okay. But that's it. I mean, that's technically also what Git does internally, right? So Git stores the hash and then has some metadata to say uh, this version uh, corresponds to this file and then the next version corresponds to the same file. So we don't store a copy if nothing has changed. And then if you change something, you get a different file, a different hash and you point to that. Right? So that's, um, I suspect it's just kind of a similar strategy outside of Git uh, directly. Um, so append-only data is kind of nice, right? Append-only data means you can always do this offset trick. Uh, it's easy to kind of deal with deltas. What happens if you have data that changes over time? Let's say something like a user database and people can update their names and things like this. How would you version something like this? If you take... Um maybe like a, a SQL database or something uh, like that, you could store it as a series of queries and just apply the queries. Um, so it's not quite diff, but it's like a sequence of changes that you'd have to run in succession, but it's more specific than just general pieces of a file. Um, so I'm not sure whether I'm understanding, uh, whether I'm mapping this to my right understanding. We talked about event sourcing before. Is this what you're getting at? Yes, that's what I'm referring to. All right, so I don't think, this is typically not transparent to, to a SQL database. So a SQL database does this in the background um, as a kind of backup mechanism, uh, typically not for a very long time. So typically you can't go back arbitrarily far in time. So the idea is that every operation is essentially described as a change 
but you don't update actual data. You can compute the most current data by applying all changes over time. Right? So this way you can go back in time to an arbitrary place. You turn a database that overwrites data into an append-only database. And in addition, you can, if it's useful, keep a materialized view or view of the latest snapshot. Right? So the view is something that you can recompute, but it's much easier to query probably than kind of always going back in time the entire time. Right? So um, the, the way that most database systems work, they have a log in the background that looks like this. And then they also keep always the most recent version. And whenever they are sure that the most recent version is written to the disk, they can discard the log. And if they crash, they have the last snapshot and the log since the last crash, so they can re restore the, the most recent version that they had in memory from the log file. Right? So they write the log much more frequently than they try to uh, just write everything that they have in, in memory. This is how most database systems are uh, implemented as far as I know. Um, so you can design a system just like this and turn it essentially into an append-only system. Another thing that's interesting here is um, kind of the snapshot or view. You can think of this in a more systematic way. In a database system, this is often called a materialized view or just a view of the data. If you have a system um, like here where, or this is maybe not the best example, but something where you have some feature processing to create another table, right? So you have the original raw input, then you do have some feature processing um, to have the input that you're using for the actual model training, right? So you're creating the raw input, the CSV file based on this or data frame, and then you put this uh, into the training process. This intermediate result is something that you could store and version, or it's something that you can recompute from the raw results, right? So, I think those are the things that I wanted to discuss here. So um, you can store entire copies like Git. This might be inefficient when, when the files are very similar. You can store deltas like Mercurial. If it's append only, you can store offsets. So maybe in this class you, you're most familiar with this from Kafka or just the line numbers in the file. Or if you know what steps you use to create the data, you can recreate it, right? So you can recreate the data by applying the same processing steps. And then there's one thing that we haven't talked about. Um, there are a couple of databases where you can version individual records. So for a specific record entry, you can go back in time. Similar like how in Git you can go back in time for different files. You can do this for every row. It essentially keeps the history of the data for every row. Uh, as far as I know, S3 buckets do this if you enable it. So it's an option that um, for every kind of in a, in a key value store, you can get all the past values for a specific key. And this works again in all kinds of different systems. Uh, often this is done in some cloud storage if you have really large data files, right? Checksum, checksums are often used to uniquely identify versions of files. This is done this way in Git. This is, uh, I think, done in S3 this way. Um, and you also want to make sure that if you have schemas and things like this, you want to version this as well. Um, Checksum and hash, I think, is to me the same thing. Um. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know if it was like a specific algorithm or something that would be used or. Um. No, okay. I, well, I, I use the terms interchangeable. Uh, I think it's just a hashing algorithm for a big file that gives you a unique number and you hope for any change that you get a, the chance of collisions, right, that two files have the same hash uh, is relatively small. Okay. Um, all right. Does this roughly make sense as kind of general strategies? I think it depends a lot what you're really doing. Um, you have a lot of these things out there. You can just make local copies of a file 
you probably want to identify this. You can use something like Git large file system to have some mechanisms nicely built in. There, there are many of those, right? Uh, you can use an append-only data storage of some form and identify some sort of index. If you have a key value store or something like this or a relational database, you can have re histories of individual records. Um, you can, if you can recreate uh, data sets, that might be an option. There's a big kind of trade-off of how expensive is it to recreate the data versus how expensive is it to store the extra data, right? Um, this is actually in, in databases also sometimes a trade-off. Do you keep the materialized view and things like this? Um, all right. How would you version models? This is coming up for you, right? So this is, I think, the next milestone. Um, run an A-B test or something like this. So you need multiple models. You might want to go back to an earlier model. Um, my model is about 400, 500 megabytes, I think. How do you version something like this? You probably want to version it on different sort of parameters, right? So if you have a model, but you've just retrained it, probably want to version that model. But if you've made like substantial changes saying switching algorithms or something, you probably want that versioned in a separate way or, or kind of separately or something like that. Okay. So, so the term version is, um, is actually fairly broad and used in different ways. Um, some people distinguish two different kinds of versions. Um, they're revisions. I can't write here. Revisions and their variants. Um, the idea is that revisions are versions in time and they supersede each other typically. So if you create a new revision, you replace the old one. Maybe you want to go back in time for some reason, but you typically don't operate with multiple revisions at the same time. Whereas variants are sometimes called variations in space instead of time are things that you have in parallel. So in a classic version control system, revisions are version numbers and variants are branches. Um, doesn't have to be, there are many different ways of dealing with variants. You can use feature flags, you can use um, uh, copies, um, all kinds of things. Um, I think what you're talking about, potentially experiments might create variants, right? You're intentionally creating uh, alternatives so that you can later pick one. They are, and until you pick one, they are not superseding each other in time, right? They are par existing in parallel. I don't think it matters much for this discussion, but you're right. Uh, you want to know um, when you update something, like every day you train a new model for your recommendation algorithm, for example, you want a new model, right? That's a revision, it's replacing the previous ones unless something goes wrong. But then if you try different models, if you're trying different hyper parameters, you're experimenting, you have also multiple versions, potentially uh, variants in, in, in space. Um, all of those we want to version in some way, right? So all of those we want to identify, um, this is a model maybe that I produced in this, with these parameters on this day. How would you go about doing that? Uh, wouldn't you be just storing the entire model along with the metadata file probably? Yes. Which... What, why are we not doing anything of the other things? like deltas, offsets, individual records? Uh, because models are essentially binary files uh, with zeros and ones. So like storing the deltas would not make much difference. They are already compressed. I think for most models that's true, right? So even small changes in inputs might essentially affect every parameter of the model where there's non-determinism in training. So even if you train this twice, uh, you get slightly different models. They have very similar characteristics, but there's very little in terms of compression, right? So if you compute the diff between two models, even a binary diff, it probably for most models doesn't gain you much. So there's probably not a huge amount of compression that you do. 
So at least as far as I know, pretty much everybody uses kind of the, the Git-like approach where you just store the entire model, right? You just store copies of it and you kind of need some tracking of metadata. Right, uh, so pretty much any system that you wanna use that can store binary data, that's files with some uh, naming convention, whether it's some, it's Git, whether it's uh, some database, um, all of these things should work. And then the last one is versioning pipelines, right? So we have created the model and we can store the, we can store the actual model, right? We can, we can version that. We've talked about how we can version the data, right? But then there's the connection between the two. How did we create the model from some data? Maybe what hyperparameters did we pick? How would you version something like this? I guess depending on how data driven your implementation is, you could actually just store the source code files that call all the, for, for example, the Python calls, or maybe you could put it into a configuration file, like an XML file um, or, or something like that, where you can, you have all your methods as modules that you can plug and unplug. Mm -hmm. um, there's some like tools that would do that, but it depends on your implementation. Right. But the data is typically big. The model is sometimes also still big. The code in between, that's just code, right? And usually not a huge amount of code. This is like a couple of lines of Python, maybe more lines of Python, maybe some frameworks, right? So you wanna know which library you have used, but we know how to version that. So I would expect that for the pipeline, we just use Git or something like this, kind of traditional version control. Hyperparameters, there's a question, they are probably in your code anyway, or if they are not, you need to version that as well. So that might be the, the script that's launching this with certain parameters. Um, there are multiple different strategies to doing that. The final task is to link these three parts, right? So you need to know this model was created with this version of the pipeline and this version of the data which you can do, like if you version these independently, right? So you get a version number for the data, you get a version number of the pipeline, maybe a version number of the hyperparameters if you wanna do that independently, um, but it's probably part of the pipeline. And then the only thing that you need to do is with when you're storing the model in the version control system, you're just saying, giving the two version numbers of the other sources, right? Of the data and of the pipeline and then you can re recreate this. If you look at the model, model version 10, you can see, oh, this was created with pipeline version 50 and data version three, right? And potentially you could go get all those parts. You can automate this more or less to re recreate um, this or run this specific code, right? So if you're going back to the, um, to the example of the credit card um, application system, if we had versioned everything, Right? We can figure out, oh, this customer prediction was made with model version 20. Then we look up, this model was trained with this version of the code and this version of the data. We could try to reproduce exactly the pipeline, maybe check whether that data uh, training code had some problem, if we figured out that the model had some problem and so on. Does this make sense? I think to somebody who's used to version control, that's none of this is magic. The main thing is that we need to think about how to deal with big, the model and the data. And I think these two big files often have different characteristics. So we might actually use different strategies for these three parts or store them in different places. Okay. Um, for the libraries or for the pipelines, there's one more thing. It often depends on frameworks and libraries. So you need to version those as well. Right, so in, in Python, for example, there's typically this requirements txt file. You wanna be careful with floating versions, um, right? So if you specify that you use uh, the library scikit-learn, 
it will up, it will if you don't specify a version it will just get the latest version which is probably not you not what you want you actually probably want to pin the version that in this specific pipeline this model was used with this version you can also put this all into a docker container and version that docker container if you want um, there's also the strategy um, google does this internally to um, commit all dependencies um, to, to your own version uh, tree, right? So that you don't depend on something like pip or something like npm that might just swap out the version underneath you. It's unlikely they all try to uh, produce and give you uh, reproducible builds, right? The same version every time. Um, this is sometimes in, in the Go terminology, this is called vendoring. Uh, there are some uh, communities where this is more common to just copy the dependencies. Um, Right, and if you really want to be sure, just version the entire environment, for example, in a Docker container. Um, and maybe even test it on some independent machine, right? So this means that you can just install this and, and re-execute this. So again, I think none of this is magic, but I think this is stuff we need to do um, to be careful here. Um, there are a couple of tools that try to help with this, that force big best practices that help with versioning. Uh, often this is sold now under machine learning operations, MLOps. Um, they often have things for versioning data, versioning models, versioning pipelines, specifying pipelines that you have multiple steps that, uh, that clearly document how an output is produced from an input so that it automatically tracks versions for you. Um, it does the metadata tracking for you, right? So where Google's good system is kind of trying to extract this after the fact, most of these systems, you write it in a certain system and the system does the tracking for you. So interestingly, I, I had three or four examples here and in the assignment where you all looked at open source tools, um, you have already looked at those tools. So um, maybe you can just ask those people to, and I, I want them by email about this, um, I can just ask them a little bit to, to talk about what these tools are doing. Um, Nathan, you want to talk a little bit about DVC? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I wrote about DVC and uh, I actually uh, have been, I, I started using DVC for uh, a project I'm working on at the SEI and I, I'm totally new to how uh, it works. So this is a good opportunity to kind of dig more into the documentation and um, learn about it. So yeah, it's, I think it's really powerful in terms of a um, remote storage uh, uh, a system because for uh, what get, get large file system, uh, while it allows you to store larger files, it is solely on a, on a like special Git server. Um, with DVC, you have the power to define other third party uh, storage systems. And, you know, it has that same functionality as uh, those same ideas and commands as Git. But I guess the trade off is you have to just remember to use it. And it can be it can be kind of, uh, it can be a lot of commands to remember to use because after you after you uh, use a Git command, you immediately have to do use a DVC command in order to keep um, the uh, uh, keep the versioning uh, kind of uh, together. But um, yeah, I guess, are there, are there any specific uh, ideas that you want me to talk about as uh, for the tool? So DVC is built on top of Git, right? So the idea is that the model files and the data files are too big to store in Git, but you, we kind of want to, to version this. Um, you also decompose your script into stages. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this works? When you run a stage, you produce a new output, right? That gets versioned based with the input. Uh, can you describe how this works? Yeah. So uh, you have the ability to define a pipeline, uh, and um, they call them stages. You can name the pipeline, or name part of the pipeline, train, or featureize, or uh, or uh, uh, pre-process, clean your data. And then if you want to reproduce 
that the or that once you run that uh, DVC run command, it gets um, those met that 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 metadata gets tracked within a uh, DVC YAML file, and um, that YAML file then allows you to reproduce that uh, that same pipeline by just referencing the stages that are described within the uh, the YAML file, and then when a new pipeline is created. Um, another uh, DVC internal file called uh, DVC block is then updated and it tracks the changes between those uh, uh, between those two uh, or tracks the change between those two files and when new parameters and uh, dependencies are set in your uh, pipeline creation. Right, so um, I think if I, if I have a pipeline and I update my training data, um, I would do something like pull the new training data and then I can run the pipeline mm -hmm. and it will use the training data to produce a model and then I can commit that model and I think it automatically identifies, I've used the current version of the training code with that version of the data, right? So there's kind of push and pull for data and push and pull for models right. and um, so when you push a model, you know which version of the code and which version of the data you have used, even though that's not all necessarily stored in the same Git project. Right. Yeah. Any questions? Anybody else? Um, so I was a little con like, how do we link between this DVC and link? Like, is there another configuration file maintained or? Yeah, DVC maintains its own configuration file that um, uh, links to the Git repository, so um, or to the .git uh, uh, folder. So all all of the uh, changes that are tracked within Git can also you know, DVC just pulls it automatically once you run those, those DVC commands. So this okay. is, is the kind of code, right? So you say there's a remote storage in this S3 bucket. Yeah, and this could be all kinds of things, right? So this can be um, different forms of cloud storage. This can be just SSH into a machine. This can be in Git itself or in Git file system. So you essentially say there's a re remote file somewhere and it kind of configures this internally and then you just commit that configuration. That's essentially a DVC knows that there's a certain file and it knows at this point when you run the stage, you have used a certain version, right? So the last version of that file that you pulled into your workspace, for example, from that remote thing is in that version. So it knows when you run a stage, which version it used um, and can track that metadata for you. Oh, got it. So, but like uh, Nathan mentioned, like we will be running DVC and Git commands separately, so. Yeah, you see an example here, yeah. right? So um, DVC will, will update a bunch of configuration files for you. Yeah. And the configuration files themselves, the metadata you store in Git. Uh, so that, you okay. To, you need to commit. So the first file essentially changes a bunch of, uh, changes this DVC config file in this case, mm -hmm. right? It just kind of stores the metadata for you. And then whenever you run something in DVC, you have updated your local configuration file, and that's the metadata that you can commit in your Git repository. Uh, okay, so so like just going with the the diagram we were having before, like it like the pipeline basically stores the model version in a way. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and if you scroll down to the uh, to the other images, um, it uh, let's see. Yeah, when I talk about yeah, so like this is the 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 S3 bucket that has the different versions of the data itself, and then if you keep scrolling down, you'll you'll see the um, the configuration file that gets created within DVC. So yeah, that has all of the uh, the, the the metadata. Uh, what specifically are you looking for? But right there, yeah, the DVC uh, dot config dot JSON. Uh... Scroll up. Oh, this thing. No. Yes. Yeah. That. So, like that. That's the uh, configuration file maintained by DVC. Uh, you're committing to Git, and uh, that is tracking all of the uh, the interaction between the remote repositories and uh, well, yeah, just the remote repositories in this case. 
But yeah. this one doesn't have the, the versions, right? The versions are stored somewhere else. No, uh, the, the versioning is done in the YAML file, uh, which if you scroll down, you'll you'll also see. <laughs> scroll um, down a bit more. Yeah, and then that's the YAML file one. that has that has the versioning and uh, the DVC lock, which tracks changes to uh, the YAML file whenever new pipelines uh, or yeah, new pipelines or dependencies and parameters are set. So there are a bunch of these things. You can also roll your own, right? Um, and track the metadata somewhere. Um, DVC is just one solution. Uh, as far as we have seen, this is not broadly adopted in open source. I don't know how much this is used in companies, um, but it's one of the tools that's um, frequently talked about. It's open source. Um, there's a company behind this. Um, they're focusing on slightly different things these days, I think, but it's, it's the broadly talked about project. And easy to try. Um, all right, second one is model DB. Um, Bob, do you want to talk about this? Uh, yeah, sure. Would you so, want to share a screen or just talk about it? Uh, um, if you want, maybe I can just share my screen of Blob yeah. and I can control it. Sure. Um, go for it. Uh, I assume it's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, MotoDB is also an open source machine learning system tool, and it can be used to version your data, your uh, code, your config files, and the environment settings. And uh, uh, basically, MotoDB uh, consists of two parts. The first part is uh, a MotoDB server. It's already integrated in a Docker Compose. Uh, instance and it's pretty uh, easy to set up this server and another part is like uh, you want to write some API calls provided by the MotoDB uh, so you can do this uh, by a Python package called Verda and you can, you can install this through pip so uh, yeah it, it's pretty easy to start to use on um, MotoDB and then uh, I uh, so I, I think one thing uh, MotoDB provided uh, is that it, it has a kind of well-designed uh, web server. So if you take a look, uh, it looks like uh, this page. So uh, this web server provides a visualization for all of your uh, information you log in the MotoDB database. So like uh, in the here it has three items. The first one is uh, projects. It contains some experiments you created and uh, it also contains all the uh, experiment inf information like your metric, your hyperparameters and your models. Uh, it will be logged here. And it also has data size. Uh, I, so basically I only try to log the uh, data side version like the timestamp. I have tried to log the data site metadata Mm -hmm. And uh, for for the repositories, I, I guess it's something uh, about your environment settings, but I haven't tried, actually tried this one. So anyway, so uh, yeah, so once you set up the experiment setting, it's really quick to do some logging. You just, like in your code, you do some calls to set up a project, set up an ex experiment. Uh, and then you, you just like, uh, I think there are all some pretty straightforward uh, API calls to use, uh, like you you can log your hyperparameters, you can log your uh, metadata of your model, and uh, of course you log, log your metrics here. So uh, after you have done th those kind of things, you can you know view the results of your uh, the, the data side you logged and all, all of the experiments information in the web server. So like here is a uh, metadata of your model, here's the metrics mm -hmm. and your hyperparameters, uh, this kind of things. So, uh, but, but for this part, just, just to put this into yeah, context, right? So um, this, this works a little bit different than DVC. So you still, I think, have your normal code, but you log statements. So this is much more when you're running a bunch of experiments, when you're 
doing variants rather than revisions, but also you can use this for revisions. Um, it just tracks, and you're kind of responsible for setting most of this up, I think. It tracks what hyperparameters you're using, and then you upload the result of the training um, so that later you can see, oh, this model was created with this hyperparameter. I think there's no automatic tracking of the source code version that was used, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I think the developers are responsible for, you know, uh, explicitly do off the logging things. Yeah. And also, you, you need to, uh, like you want to log your hyperparameters, so you, you need to define and write what the hyperparameters here mm -hmm. are. So, uh, I don't think it, it, it can automatically track anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, DVC, by the way, also has support for experiments, I think, with branches. So you can create branches and has some extra files for configuration parameters where you can just try different configuration parameters for the same thing, then run it somewhere in the cloud and store the results. Um, I haven't tried to push this anywhere. Um, right? Uh, maybe I might have missed it, but does it version data? Uh, yeah, I think I think there are ways to uh, version the metadata of data side, but uh, yeah. So in my try, actually only you know version the uh, the likes the time set of of the data side I use. So I, I didn't actually uh, version the metadata of the data side. Okay. Yeah, I would expect that you you're responsible for logging which version of the data you have, right, and that you use some some database that has a version mechanism. Yeah. Like if you're versioning S3 buckets, you could just store the timestamp when you pulled it. If you're using like Git file system, you could store the char or the commit of the file that you're using, something like this. All right. Anything else or? Uh, uh, maybe, uh, I think that's it. So maybe just uh, a quick summary to MotoDB, I think like, Mm -hmm. uh, so he, here's the architecture. I didn't put this picture in my blog, but uh, as you can see, I think MotoDB uh, is able to uh, kind of smoothly integrate with things like Kubernetes and uh, probably some also some other popular frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. So I think, uh, yeah, it is still evolving and provides some uh, good integration with other uh, external tools. So I think this is kind of uh, another advantage of MotoDB. Do you have a, set of how, uh, a sense of how broadly this is used? I, th I think this is an, was an academic project and they're trying to build a startup around it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think Verda AI is a startup founded by the uh, am I a student who created this tool? Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, the last one I have in my list is um, ML flow. Kevin has looked at this, but I'm not sure that I've given him enough warning. Um, would you mind talking about this? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you want me to share the screen or do you have something you want to show? Uh, I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys can see my screen. Uh, so from what Bach just talked about in ModelDB, it sounds like MLflow is going to be pretty similar. It's basically an, an open source tool that allows uh, data scientists to um, basically do best practices from the entire uh, model learning pipeline from uh, data collection, data cleaning, creating your models and deploying it. Um, so they have three components and the one for provenance is called uh, ML tracking. So here, this is my code that I used for individual assignment two, where we had to design a prediction system for streaming. Um, and MLflow, it's designed to pretty much work right out of the box. Once you pip install it, you just include an import in your code. And then, um, so like, ModelDB, you have to manually log all the things that you want to track. So there are three functions that I looked into to do that. One is log param, which basically just you can log any hyperparameter that you're interested in for your model. Um, another is log metric, which is used basically to, as the name suggests, log uh, 
any performance metrics of the model. And then what's also interesting is there's this log artifact call, which basically lets you log any file um, on your machine and it'll get saved onto the MLflow tracking server. Uh, so if I run an example of this, I can show you what it'll look like. So this code, it's basically doing all those steps that I mentioned. It's going to clean the data I have uh, from this raw data file. It's going to generate a model and it's going to evaluate it. And because I incorporated MLflow, it'll uh, log all this stuff. And uh, so for me, it'll actually save it as a local file. But what you can also do is uh, set up a MLflow tracking server and pro provide MLflow that URI, and it'll log it to a remote server instead. I suspect this is also similar that doesn't automatically store the version of your pipeline or the version of your data you have to do. So, so somehow it does. So MLflow somehow was able to integrate with, I think my GitHub repo and it actually automatically logs the, uh, the commit for uh, the commit for the code that you're actually running. So that's done and we can actually see now. Okay. Yeah, so this was the last run I did. Um, it just, it gives you the run name, right? The person who ran it, the piece of code that actually got executed. And as I said, it automatically did this for me. It just gives you the commit hash in GitHub. So you can go back in GitHub and look at that version of the code. And then these are the parameters that I logged mm -hmm. and the metrics. And uh, if you go further in, uh, you can see that this is the artifact that I logged. This is basically just the raw data set, right? So if you were to start a run and you wanted to keep track of, you know, what data you use to generate this model, you can do it this way. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention was there's also this uh, log model call, which actually logs the model itself. And, um, as you can see, it gets logged here. And there's this pickle version that you can download directly um, and you can unpickle it in a Python script to run it. Uh, these other files here, they're generated so that you can just use the MLflow tracking API to load this model directly without having to download this pickle and um, use it. Yeah. So, and yeah. You integrate with some deployment script or something like this, yeah? Right. Sounds good. Does anybody have questions? So, so the second two are much more, I think I haven't, I haven't used this much, but I think they feel much more like the logging framework where you can like if you're using Prometheus or something like this, where you can log certain information and it doesn't just track kind of numbers over time, right? It's not a time series database, but you say explicitly, now I'm starting a specific run. Here's all the information for that run. Here's a code version of that run or the data version. And some of this is done more, more automatic than others. I think DVC tries to do a little bit more of the metadata tracking and kind of defining for you how a pipeline should look, that you have multiple steps and it stores the intermediate results and it knows how to run parts of this based on past results. But um, uh, yeah, so these are, and from what I've seen, these are I think also the most common tools in this area. There are a bunch of others. Um, there's a lot of movement, lots of people trying things, implementing things. Um, I don't have a, super clear sense of which version is the most popular. I think MLflow has quite a big community. Um, DVC is, lot, is talked about a lot. I'm not sure about um, ModelDB and the others as well. Any more comments, any questions? Right, um, maybe interesting, uh, there's also work on Kind of versioning in uh, notebooks. Um, there's a this is a research project. I don't think there's any commercial tool or anything at this point. Um, but here at CMU, there's a there's a project um, where Mary Beth Carey works on kind of versioning in notebooks. 
um, which has a very different flavor. And we talked about how data scientists work differently, but I think it's interesting to bring up here as well. Um, so in a notebook, people don't usually commit the entire notebook all the time. They do a lot of experiments back and forth, try something in a cell, run it, run it again, and so on without ever versioning something, right? Um, and kind of going back there or understanding what has happened is hard. The thing that Verdant does, the tool here, is it tracks fine-grained history within a notebook. Like this cell was run, this was the output, the cell was changed as following. And it has a bunch of tools to explore what you did in the past, essentially. So if you wanna see uh, the output of the cell has changed, but I like the graph or the results that I had five minutes ago better. You can go back in the history of that uh, specific um, graph. I'm not sure, I think there were some examples here. I'm not sure how much I can just play here. Um, if it works. Um, can, Don't think YouTube is cooperating. All right, anyway, so you see here on the side kind of a history of specific cells. You can navigate this. Um, uh, you can see potentially the output of a cell at, at different stages, um, right? If you click this cell, you see the output in the past was this. You can go back to a result in the past, look at this. Um, this is completely different from what we just talked about. Um, and not really relevant, I just wanted to bring up, there's also versioning here that's potentially interesting. Okay. Um, and then in all these cases, there's also lots of work on deployment, right? So, yeah, thanks. Um, that's really not useful to show me this now. Get away. Um, so once you have a specific model version and you're happy with this, you can, trigger some sort of deployment after the fact and there are a bunch of tools and it depends on where you deploy it, how you deploy it. Um, you talked about some of those also as part of the homework, right? So there are a couple of blog posts about some of those as well. Um, some of this is just pushing this into production. Some of this is connecting this with canary tests uh, to release it incrementally. Some of this is um, um, load balancing this automatically. And then the last part that's actually really needed that we haven't talked about, if you're serving models in production and now you're getting user requests, like specific information to give you a credit rating, right? Or a credit card offer, you need to lock that information and need to make sure that you connect the user request with the version of the model that was used, right? So you need some sort of logging and that logging needs to include the model version. And if you have that, then you can track everything back, right? So in practice, a good version that tracks all this information tracks the version of the model and you can go back how that was created. And then you have a mapping to figure out which prediction has been performed with which model, right? And if you have more complicated models that have multiple stages, you need to do this for every step, right? So you really want logging or audit traces in some form. Version everything and record every model evaluation in some log file, have an append only log, um, back it up. And if a customer complains about it at some point, uh, this should be sufficient to replay what you've been doing. Right, so, and if you have something, this was the other example, but something composed, right? So multiple models in a row, you want to know this this model did a prediction at this point with this version, the result was the following that was used here with this version and so on, right? So you could have log files for everything that can actually reproduce what happens. So we don't have much time, but um, maybe just for you to briefly reflect um, in the movie recommendation scenario, um, it's not super complicated, it's just one model, right? But you can think about how would you figure out you made a specific recommendation. For example, a bunch of users got really poor review or poor recommendations yesterday and you want to figure out why, right? Based on your log files, are you able to figure out which model has made the prediction? Figuring out which model has made the prediction 
are you able to figure out how was the model trained? What data was the model trained on? And so those are the kind of questions that um, I don't think it's super hard to do, but it requires some infrastructure and some thinking about uh, logging the right information that you can actually do this. Any questions? All right, let me skip this and jump here. Um, just briefly, so reproducibility is, what we talked about is not exactly reproducibility. It's figuring out where does stuff come from. Reproducibility is whether you can recreate the same models, for example. Um, Technically, you can talk about different terms here, reproducibility versus replicability. Um, there's a big kind of discussion in science, uh, whether kind of reproducing exactly the results of a scientific experiment is nice, but doesn't tell us that much. It just means that we can install the same software and run the same thing. Uh, what we typically want to do is kind of repeat the experiment independently, kind of set up the similar things, change some things and see that we get a similar result that's consistent with the prediction. For our purpose, what we really care about is can we recreate the model and pretty much get the same result? Um, I think technically this would typically be called re replicability, but it's in this community is mostly called reproducibility. Um, so in a practical sense, what we really care about is can we reproduce a research result or a specific um, prediction? Can we recreate the model from training data? Um, and essentially at the technical level, it's exactly what we talked about before. If you version everything, if you version your pipeline, if you version the hyperparameters, if you version the data, you can just run the training scripts again. So, now there's non-determinism in training. Um, so if you have exactly the same data and exactly the same code, um, would you expect to get this exactly the same model? What sources of non-determinism can you think of? In my chat window went away with all the screen sharing. Give me a second. What may make it hard, even if you have exactly the same code version, exactly the same uh, data, make it hard to get exactly the same model? There's like random initialization functions. So if you're doing like gradient descent, some sort of you know starting point or, or like clustering, um, you, you have starting points and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Right, so a lot, of, a lot of machine learning models, especially deep neural networks, clustering, uh, require randomness, right? In deep neural networks, you just analyze all the weights in, uh, randomly initially. You can't start with zero. Um, you could potentially um, start in the same place. Right, he talks about the random split between training data and um, validation data, right? So that's often done randomly. Um, that would lead to different results. There's some machine learning models that are deterministic. So you would expect to get exactly the same results. Um, do you have an example of one? If we are using exactly same data, then decision trees or linear regression will do the same yep. model? Decision trees should, um, they have a deterministic way um, to figure out how to split things, right? They optimize for something. And if you have exactly the same data again, the same hyperparameters, you would expect to get exactly the same uh, tree. Um, for linear regression, probably the same. Um, Right, so not every, every technique is, is different. So there's a, there's a bunch of places of non-determinism um, in learning algorithms. Uh, distributed learning might be another thing, right, where just a distribution mechanism might introduce more um, non-determinism. Um, 
and many classic notebooks and pipelines uh, contain non-determinism. So for example, you might not version your data precisely. You might use today's weather data or whatever you get from um, IMDB today, right? That might be different tomorrow. So it might be hard to reproduce a notebook directly. If you just look at notebook code, it's common that it depends on the current time or at random seeds. Um, not so sure how much this matters in practice, most of these things. Um, there's certainly non-determinism in learning and you might wanna check uh, if you retrain the model on the same data two or three times, do you get relatively stable results or does it vary widely? Um, and yeah, different library versions that might be installed on a machine, maybe you train somewhere else with a different library version may affect the results. So reproducing a notebook, kind of a data science notebook exactly is actually pretty hard. Uh, if you just download a notebook from uh, GitHub and try to execute this. For classic machine learning pipelines that you might use in a company, uh, you can probably get rid or control most of the sources of non-determinism, like um, version your data set, make sure that your hyperparameters are clear, um, that you use this. You could even set a specific seed for, for some learning functions. So in the end, I think I'm just coming back to the same recommendations. Really the entire lecture today is version everything, right? This is essentially the whole message today. Version uh, code, version data, version the models. Um, documentation is useful. Um, document your intention, your assumptions in the process, not just the results, um, so that other people can recreate this, can understand it. Um, document why data is cleaned in a certain way, right? That people can reproduce it, uh, understand it. Um, document why certain hyperparameters have been chosen. Maybe you've run some experiments. Um, look at the determinism of the pipeline steps. You could test that. A simple test is just run it three times and see whether you get exactly the same result. Run it on different machines, see whether you get the same result. This is sometimes actually used um, for security reasons in builds. Uh, reproducible builds um, is something that Debian has invested quite some effort in. They want to see that if multiple people compile the same source code on different machines, they actually get the, exactly the same binary. Um, they want to avoid certain attacks that somebody sneaks in a kind of a malicious compiler or something. Um, this is actually also really hard because a lot of code has some timestamps somewhere in there when you download something it uses a version of the file system or something like this. Um, so there's accidental non-determinism in a lot of builds and then test and containerize potentially. That's all I have. Um, summary from today is versioning, 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 pretty much. I version everything. Um, provenance is important. It's an important debugging thing in practice. Um, you're running experiments, you have lots of versions of things, um, and there are lots of tools, and I'm not sure that it's important or that you want to adopt all of them in, in your assignment in, in the project, uh, but I think a lot of them are interesting to look at, and um, there's probably a bunch of things to learn from. All right.